Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, welcome back to Bite Size Balance. It's your host, Wendy McCallum, and I'm here again with my friend, Dr. Sarah Bailey. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So we're going to talk about female friendships today. Which kind of means talking about ourselves. It sort of does. Uh, there was a pause there because I was thinking exactly the same thing. So we all we'll talk about our own friendship, obviously, which is a, a source of fascination for many people, I think, because if you've been listening to this podcast since the early days, or even if you joined us in season two or season three, and you went back and listened to the episodes, you can actually see the evolution of this friendship in the podcast episodes. Like I, I almost want Sarah to go back and listen to the very first episode of Bite Size Balance, where I was calling it my fake podcast, which was like, you and I were not friends yet then we were, we just were colleagues and, you know, you were my naturopathic doctor. And I said, can you come on and talk about this topic? And, Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be really interesting to just have like snippets of those conversations that we've had over the last three years now, Mm -hmm. Um, just have those like chronologically. And I think you'd be able to see the evolution of like how we've gone, went from formal to casual and, and also probably would be really interesting to see. I think it would be apparent even from the early conversations that there was kind of a, like a spark between us and we, but you probably would be able to predict that yeah. we would have become as good friends as we are now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, we, we just thought we'd come on and talk about friendships, you know, particularly in midlife and, and how things change and, and our own sort of some of our own relationships and just some of the, some of the thoughts and musings that we have around female friendship. And of course, we've talked before on this podcast about the importance of connection for women And how that is often one of the things that is missing for, it becomes uh, one of the missing pieces for women in midlife. I mean, honestly, I would say at least with 90% of my clients, it comes up, we start talking about what's, how's, how are you doing with friendships and connections? And you feel like they're meaningful and you need more of that. And then how can we foster that? And definitely with the women that I work with who are working hard to change their relationship with alcohol, the connection piece is really, really key, which is one of the reasons why I have what I call like a back-end membership for women. It's usually running that allows my one-on-one clients to move into this sort of curated community I have of uh, alumni, I call them. So women who've worked with me privately, because I recognize the importance of connection for women and knowing other women who are... um, in the same stage and place and have the same challenges and, Mm -hmm. and goals as you do. So I'm a huge fan of connection between women. And I, I have lots of thoughts about female friendships and how important they are, but also the way that I view friendships probably has changed over the years. And I know it has for you too. So we wanted to talk about that. So where do we start here? I don't know. I think, um, I think the thing that's, um, the thing that always surprises me is how little women talk to each other about like we're women are good communicators generally, I think, but there's often a line that's not crossed in terms of really delving into that vulnerability place. Like I remember being, I remember being the older mother on the playground with newborns, with a newborn and a toddler, Mm -hmm. and being the only one who was really saying out loud, this sucks. Like, (laughs) you know, my experience was at the time was that I, you know, obviously like many mothers, I hadn't slept. I had uh, one who was throwing up all the time. Like it, it didn't matter. What I was saying was, this is not what I expected it to be. And frankly, I'm having a rough time. And I was, I've always kind of been a say it as it is kind of person. And I always felt like that 
opened the doors to the other women on the playground. I wasn't doing it intentionally. It was just who I was to actually say like, oh yeah, I can stop pretending. Um, and I, that was just at the time of life when, um, or the time when uh, there was a website. It was like when all the mother websites started, yeah. you know, and there was one, I might've said this another time, but there was one where this woman was a homesteader and she had sheep and four children and she my friend had told me to go to her website you know how I feel about social media in general so I, like it wasn't the first thing I wanted to do but I went and this woman had like it was a rainy day and she had all carded one of her children was in the corner carding the wool another one was dying it someone else was you know covered in mess baking Another one was reading, at, you know, like a grade 12 level and they were five or something like that, you know, and it was just like this feeling of competition. Yeah. I, I was so angry when I read that. I thought I can't, I can't, I, I can't compete in this world. This is, this is not for me, but I found, and this has probably gotten even worse with, with the rise of social media, but I found that, that, that women were afraid to talk to each other about how they were really feeling. Um, because of that, because of that feeling of competition, like it, you had to be doing the best job as a mom, you had to be the happiest, you had to be the most, you had to be the most in love with your children. Yeah. And I think that that's translated into midlife now for a lot of women, which is like, I, I'm managing, I'm fine, everything's good. Midlife is, this is not hard. I've got this. Woo. I've got this. I'm drinking my green smoothie every morning. I'm okay. drinking my wine and my, my, for most of us drinking my wine and my freaking coffee cup. Yeah. But yeah. Not, so, not, in, not necessarily in the morning. I'm just saying like all those doing- things, like women on the playground with like, you're never going to know what's in this cup, you know? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think that that, that was for me, the first, the first, my first observation that women weren't talking about what was really happening. And because I spend all day with women talking about what's really happening, I I think for me, it was like this cognitive dissonance. It was just like, what is this thing that's happening out in the world? And I I think this prevents depth of friendship. It's it's almost like everybody's in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that probably goes on for the entire like mid thirties to the time when you're at that bottom of the U bend in your late forties. And so I, I I think that that's one of the things that happens in women's friendships is that busyness and uh, a little bit of competition and social media and like, not that we want to be competitive with each other. Society sets us up to be competitive, right? Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Yeah. So I think that it's the, the real gift for me. I've, I mean, I've, frankly, I've always, since my mid, uh, I think probably since I went to naturopathic school, I've been, I've had some, some insight um, around the fact that I, there was, there were certain relationships that I didn't need in my life. And I was kind of able to gently distance myself from them. But um, my relationships, luckily the ones that have stuck around, the ones that people that I still really connect with are people for whom like, it's um like, you know, there's a superficial of let's get all the stuff out of the way of, you know, how is the volleyball tournament this weekend? And then deep dive, right? right. And that's, that's how I've always operated. So, or at least since my sort of mid twenties. And so I'm, I really value my friends that do that. And I don't do the superficial because I'm really bad at it. But I think a lot of women are putting a lot of energy into possibly relationships that aren't nurturing them as well as they could be. Yeah. Um, and that this like transition into perimenopause and menopause gives you that opportunity to, to actually like not spend energy on the ones that aren't really serving you. Um, yeah. Does, yeah. That, does that make sense? I'm yeah, just, no, like, totally. I'm totally. totally riffing. Like I'm just, uh. no, 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 no. It totally makes sense. I mean, I have, um, I have, I wrote, I've, I've written this piece and in this, in this like fictional novel that I'm working on, I talk, I talk a lot about this whole, the loneliness of motherhood and how we don't talk about that enough. And, and the, because for me going through that period, I was so, so lucky that my best pal from forever, 
is still my best pal. Like she's just been in my life since I was 18 and she's like another sister to me. And, and I'm just so lucky that we lived next to each other for most of the years that my kids were really little. And uh, so I had her in my corner, but even with her, I think we were so busy with all, I mean, she has three kids. I had two kids, seven months apart. Like we were regularly, it was us with five kids together trying to like keep everyone alive, you know? There wasn't a lot of time for stuff. And as you were talking, I was thinking, even with her, the person who knows me probably better than anyone, it still felt a lot of the time, like we stayed at the surface on things because we had to, like, it was just a necessity to get through the day. We just couldn't, and there wasn't time. And then I think about when I, when I, my kids started to get older and I, there was more time to actually talk to the women that were the parents of my kids friends because that's who I was with a lot of the time I just remember that feel this feeling of longing like I just want this to go deeper I want this to go longer this conversation but then there was always like a distraction you know there was a, a kid who needed help with something or a you know somebody hurt themselves and so the conversations were always getting cut short and it, there just was not that physically there just wasn't much of an opportunity to go deeper and then you're so exhausted that you're going to bed as soon as you can get yourself into bed and waking up and doing it all again the next day. So I think there is definitely a period of time where female friendships are really put to the test. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of the time there's that there's, there's, and I guess the, the good news is, is I feel like this is temporary and that's really what I wanted to talk about today. I feel like it's a temporary pause on deep level connection. And if you're lucky enough to still have deep level connection during that period, and it's, then that's amazing. Um, and I think probably many women do have that, but I didn't feel like I had that. I felt like I was, I felt that competition piece, Sarah, which is also something I write about. I felt like, I just felt like I needed to be always grateful and happy to be parenting and to be mothering. And for me, maybe that was even more turned up as a result of how hard it was for me to have those kids and all of the things that I went through and how grateful I am obviously to my son's birth family. And just, it just felt like you can't complain about this. This is all you've been talking about for the last, however many years. And this is what all of the hard stuff and the grief and everything was for. It was to get to this place. So you can't admit that to anyone. You need to be happy and grateful. And, you know, it's not okay for you to, to not feel that. And the truth is, is that it's really effing hard to be a mother. It's hard, hard work. And it's hard it's hard to do that and feel the loneliness that goes along with that a lot of the time. And because you can be surrounded by people. And I had lots of other women in my life all the time. I was always at play groups or, you know, whatever. Sure. I spent a lot of time by myself in the middle of the night with a kid hanging off me, but I was also with women a lot and it still felt lonely because the level of connection was not what I crave as a human being. And so the nice thing is, is like, I'm seeing that shift on the other side. I'm seeing that me, I'm seeing that change. So my relationship with my friend who's been my friend since I was 18 is, oh my gosh, we're just, it's just like a whole other level, that friendship. And it's been shifting as our, as our nests started to empty. And so this is my friend, Megan, who was on the empty nesting episode, um, where we talked about what we have, I think we did, we might've even done two like ter terror about empty nesting um, and then what it was actually like once it happened. But that friendship is really, um, it's, it's really deepened in a way that I didn't even actually know there was room for it to deepen more, to be perfectly honest, but it really has. And that's been very, very cool. And it's so much more honest and vul vulnerable now, I think, than it was around parenting, marriage, marriage is hard, like long-term partnership is hard. Like it's hard. And we're just much more honest about that in midlife and how we're feeling and all the rest of it. So that's been really cool too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, as I talk about often about how that, like, uh, the moving through perimenopause is, um, is a chance to really like get to that center of what you need and then, and, and with that often comes a feeling of, well, what have I got to lose? Like, let's go out yeah. and get this thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I have nothing to lose with being vulnerable with you. Yeah. Nothing. I have only things to gain. And I see that now, you know, right. that, like moving through it. It's like the more vulnerable I am, the more I actually benefit 
Yeah. And the, the, that's, that's totally true. And that the reason why our friendship has, ex, has the, the depth of our friendship has accelerated at the pace it's accelerated at is because of that vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it started from a place of vulnerability. It started from me saying what the actual F is going on. And I don't think I can keep going like this. And you saying, this is totally normal here's what's happening and it doesn't have to stay this way. And that, so we started with this moment of vulnerability and yes, it was in your office with you as my treating, you know, practitioner, but from there, the conversations that we've had have just gotten more and more honest. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that I'm looking for now in friendships that really matters to me in friendships with women. And I only have a a few and it's okay. There are only a select few people in my life who I feel fall into this category where I can be completely honest and not be afraid they will judge me or walk away. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that I had or felt in those middle years with my kids. I was worried about being judged all the time and therefore afraid to be honest about how I was feeling about things. And now it's just so freeing to have these people in my life that I feel, I mean, the the level of sharing that happens between you and I, for example, and we've only known each other really for three years in a, in a meaningful way is pretty big. Mm-hmm. I mean, you and I are not, not talking about very much. Like we talk about a lot of the things and I am not concerned ever that you are going to walk away. Mm-hmm. And that is like unconditional love in a female friendship, which I think is very, very cool. And not, I did feel like my friendships, a lot of them were very conditional during my mothering years. Mm-hmm. Conditional on my, our kids continuing to be friends, conditional on, you know, there being space and time for that friendship to happen, conditional on me, maybe not really showing up as my true honest self <laughs> honestly sometimes right like um yeah but I, I also think that the, I think also that's part of this and I don't really have an answer for why other than the hormones but hmm. um I think that's part of this perimenopausal menopausal journey like it's like that not giving a fuck anymore that, that yeah. we talk about it's just like I don't actually I don't I don't care to invest in relationships that I, that I find hurtful, or I feel competitive in, or I feel somehow like defensive, but, but I don't actually, I'm I'm not actually that concerned about being vulnerable with the people that I do love and care about, you know? So there's, so it does come with kind of that. It's like, it's, I don't really um, know how to define, I guess the words are still coming to me over time. It's just like, what is this freedom that comes on the other side of menopause where you're just like, no, I, this is what I want. And I want a relationship with this person. And in order to do that, I need to be all in, you know, I need to. It's agency, Sarah. It's my word of the year. It's agency. And the definition is taped to my laptop station right now. So I'm going to read it one more time for everyone. It's agency, I swear. A sense of agency is a subjective measure that determines the degree to which you feel you have control over your mind, body, and environment. In many ways, it is your ability to take action and be effective, assume responsibility for your behavior, and influence your own life. Like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's, it's the thing, it's the feeling that I've had now for the last year or so of like, I, yes, there are people who still rely on me. Of course, I'm still a parent and my children are home and we will be recording another episode on how that's feeling. But um, I'm also, I also am in this place where I feel like for the first time ever, not ever, for the first time since I got married, maybe even before, it was maybe even was before the marriage. Maybe it was even before. It's not necessarily tied to the, to the act of marriage per se. It's just to like where I was in my life at that point. But for the first time in a very long time, decades, I feel like I am running this show. Mm-hmm. It is my show. It's not anybody else's show. And I'm running it and I am deciding. And of course, there are lots of people that I want to be around for the show <laughs> that I want in my life. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm making all the decisions. I am in control of how this thing goes. And if there's something that doesn't feel good to me, then I am the only person who can change it. And the only person who will change it, 
who will even notice it probably. And I owe it to myself to do that. And so I'm, I'm just, it's a, it's a very, very different feeling from where I was like five or six years ago. And I think agency is what happens to women post menopause. I really do. I think it's that feeling of like, coming back to yourself, which is how you described it in the very first episode of Bite Size Balance season one, you talked about this idea of coming home to yourself, the estrogen turning inward and you taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is a feeling of coming home, but honestly, I'm not sure I've ever felt this at home in my own body as I do now post-menopause, because even before I had all of these responsibilities and people to take care of, I would... I wasn't confident. I didn't know who I was. I had all of these insecurities and all of this stuff. And now the the beauty and the gift of, of post-menopause and midlife for women is that, you know, most of us don't have all those things anymore. Like we've, again, it's that I don't have any fucks left to give. And also I can do a lot. Look at everything I've done in the last 20, 30 years and these decades where I've been taking care of all of these things and doing all of this stuff. Right. So that combined life experience that leads to the confidence plus the sense of agency and the declining estrogen and coming home to yourself. I think it's just like this amazing, magical combination of things that happens. And then you put on top of, so, so from that comes hopefully a comfort level with talking about the things that are actually happening in your life. Mm -hmm. And if you can find that comfort level, because you don't actually have as much invested in what other people think, um, then that sows the seed for deepening relationships, whether it be a relationship like yours and Megan's, which has been, you know, Mm -hmm. lifelong or whether it be new relationships like ours. Um, and I find that, oh, I have three or four friends who I probably connect with, they live in other places. I connect with them literally once every six months to two years. And, um, we, uh, there's very little small talk around that. It's basically like, I'm connecting with you because you're like one of my coven, you're one of my soul yeah. sisters and yeah. you go straight into it. And now that it's, it's interesting because post menopausally, what now that I have some more space as well, I'm finding myself reaching out to them more, you know, now that we have more time, we might not have seen, seen each other for the last 15 years, but it's like, oh, I know that there's a lot of potential because I knew there was a lot of potential back then. And I know that there's a lot of potential now for this relationship to like be so great postmenopausally. Totally. Yeah. And I was, I was saying to you that I have a one friend who I feel like we had, you know, our kids were at the same or kids were kind of the same ages for, and for a period of time, we were, we were constantly with each other because of the fact that our kids were constantly together. And we had, and that was one of those, one of the, few friendships, I think during that period of time when my kids were young, where I thought this person's like my person, like I really connect very deeply with this person. And I, um, and then we sort of grew apart because our kids, our kids, like life just happened, right? Our kids got older. They weren't, we weren't, you know, needed at all the things anymore together. And life took her one way and me another way. And now we've kind of come back together and it feels like it did then except better. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I, yeah, I think that that is, that's totally possible with people that you, even people that you met during those years when it felt like you weren't going deep, deep in the way you wanted to go deep, like that potential was always there. And then I have the same thing. I have friends that I've met, I've had in my life for ages and also some that are newer friends who I only see once every year or two or talk to every whatever year. And it feels like I just saw them yesterday and we can immediately get into it. And it's, it's usually because if they're newer friendships, it's usually because it started with vulnerability. So mm-hmm. it started that way. It was very honest. The very first conversation was very honest. I always use my friend, Aaron, as an example in Ontario, who came up to me at a coaching certification course we were in, in Toronto and said, I feel like I've known you forever. I feel like you're or something like that. Like I'm meant to get to know you. And I remember thinking, this is so weird, but she was right. You know, and she wasn't afraid to say that. She's super confident, amazing person. And she wasn't afraid to say that. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's female friendships and that our ability and capacity for a level of intimacy and vulnerability and depth in friendships when we move through midlife and into the postmenopausal stage is one of the gifts of midlife. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what we wanted to talk about today. And then, you know, of course, our, our friendship is, is such a good example of that, I think, in that it was a surprise. We did have to work at it in the beginning, though. I do want to say that, like, you kind of have to work at this. It doesn't just fall into your lap. You have to go, once you realize, oh, I don't have enough of this right now. I wish I had more of this. You have to go out and, and work at it a little bit. And as I've said before on this podcast, you have to treat it, I think, a little bit like the dating game. And you have to go and, like, hang out with different women who you think might be mm-hmm. your people. And some of them probably won't be, but you'd be surprised. I've discovered a few in the last five years that are actually really meaningful people in my life now as a result of taking a chance on it and saying like, Hey, any chance you want to meet me for coffee or do you want to get together for brunch this weekend? Or could we go for a walk after dinner? Um, and, and then having that be like a really lovely gift surprise that comes from that. Yeah. Because one one thing I wanted to point out that you know we, because we both have kids we talk a lot about the you know the mothering years and those sorts of things but I actually think for people who do not have children for whatever reason I think that that energy might be and I'm I'm kind of guessing just from my experience with uh, patients and friends but I'm thinking that the energy of nurturing um, all of that that it may it may take a similar it may look similar it's just that the energy is not going into kids it's going into work yeah, for sure. Yep. And so therefore there's like, so that, and the relationships within work then become about work and about super, you know, the superficial and that hopefully also for there also for that group of women, that there is also this change at menopause where it's, it's a similar, it's a similar shift from maybe yeah. all being about these corporate, not corporate, but these um, uh, work relationships mm. and being able to deepen or finding other relationships. Well, and I also think, I mean, I obviously don't have experience with be, with not being a mother in my 30s. That's all I know. But I also think about, you know, my friends who chose not to have kids or who couldn't have kids or my the clients I know who, who, who didn't have children. And I think it must have been a weird time for them, too, when all the people who were doing the mothering were like freaking not available we weren't even available to ourselves let alone to our to our other friends you know and to other women and so I don't know maybe I'm wrong on that but like there's it was probably it was probably a time for them as well they were nurtured the nurturing maybe was being directed those hormones were kind of coming being directed at other aspects of life for them than than children but um, also on top of that like all of the women that were that they were surrounded by were many of the women they were surrounded by were so friggin' exhausted and distracted with the families and the parenting and the, all the rest of it, that they probably weren't as available to them. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't available to my friends who didn't have children in the way, but I also wasn't available to my friends who had children. <laughs> I wasn't available to anyone during that period of time. So hopefully this is just like every woman experiences this in some way post you know, I'm not say post midlife, but I guess it's technically post midlife. I mean, I'm well past the halfway mark in my life. Maybe I'll be a Okinawan octogenarian, what are they called? Centigenarian, <laughs> but <laughs> who lives to 110, but I doubt it. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's just a, it's just, we wanted this to be a really positive episode just to talk about mm-hmm. our experience in our own friendship, but also in other friendships over the last five or six years since the two of us have moved through the ends of perimenopause and into postmenopause. Right. Right. So on that note, friend. And see you for a dog walk later. I'll see you for a dog walk later. Dog walk later for sure. I hope the COVID situation changes at your kid's school at this. We were talking about this in the last episode we recorded. Sarah's kids are banned from school right now because there's been a COVID outbreak and we're both shaking our heads about the fact that we're back to this place we thought we'd never be at. And uh, yeah, I will talk to you soon. And if you guys listening have stories of female friendships or you've experienced the kinds of things that Sarah and I are talking about in terms of changing, transitioning friendships and noticing that things are, the friendships might be deepening now in midlife for you, 
I would love to hear from you. You can always send me an email through my website, just through the contact me part of my website, send me a note and let me know. And if you're enjoying these episodes, or if there's a topic that we haven't talked about yet that you would love to hear us either talk about ourselves or bring an expert on to talk about it's we're just wrapping up the end of season three of Bite Size Balance and we're looking for topics for season four so send them our way all right Sarah thank you very much we'll talk to you soon bye you've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host Wendy McCallum as a burnout and balance coach I help busy high achievers like you create a more balanced joyful life If you've been putting yourself last for way too long and are worried that you're burning out, grab your free burnout checklist at www.wendymccallum.com forward slash checklist. That's www.wendymccallum.com forward slash checklist.